Good morning. I want to welcome you to Redeemer Baptist Church. It is wonderful to see all of you in person and not just on a computer screen. So with that being said, let's stand together and sing. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing morning. Coming through. <laughs> Every Sunday we begin our service by hearing from God's word as a reminder that God is alive, present, and wants us to hear from him. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 103 verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This is the word of the Lord. Sing bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Sun, the 
seated. Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Baptist Church. We are so glad that all of you guys are here with us. Isn't it fun to get back together like this? It is so exciting, and we are so excited that God is giving us this opportunity. We want to be good stewards of that opportunity, and so I wanted just to briefly explain to you guys in person why we are asking uh, people to mask up again, even if you've been vaccinated. Uh, we're doing this because the CDC's new guidelines for the current surge, resurgence of the COVID uh, Delta variant virus um, is that everyone, even if you've been vaccinated, that you should mask up when indoors. And, and we want to be good, responsible citizens of our community. Uh, unfortunately, if you've been following the news, uh, you know, in all of June throughout San Luis Obispo County, we just had a, a, about 130 cases. And then the second week of July, we ended up with that in one week. And then the third week of July, it doubled. So the, the disease is resurging. And we want to be good stewards of our bodies and the opportunities we have. We don't want to stop having to meet together, right? So I think we can all agree it's better to be masked up indoors together than to be apart or to, uh, you know, have to be online in Zoom. And so we want, to, we want to be good stewards of that. So that's why we're asking everyone to mask up. And part of this really flows into our vision as a church, right? We are here to serve not ourselves, but our community and each other. We're here to be in the business of proclaiming and living out good news, and we want to be able to do that as freely and as openly as we can. We want to worship together the ways that God has called us to worship together while we're busy making disciples of one another and becoming better and better disciples of Jesus ourselves. And we want to steward all of life to God's glory, and we do that together as a gospel-centered community. So we just think it's a natural flowing reality that as long as this is the guidelines from the government, we're going to keep following those, uh, be uh, good stewards of this moment and this opportunity that we have together as a church body, okay? Uh, so glad all of you are here. We have just a couple of announcements. They're pretty basic. Next week we are back in Zoom worship. Uh, and we're continuing that pattern every other week through the month of August. So we'll be back here on August 15th, August 29th, God willing. 
Then we're going to take one more break for Labor Day. Uh, uh, we'll be on Zoom for, for the, that weekend, September f- uh, 5th. And then on September 12th, God willing, we are going to be back here every week in person. That's our plan, all right? So we need you guys to be praying that's going to happen. There's a few variables that we still have to kind of jump through. And you're going to see that each time that you come over the next few weeks, as we become more and more used to being back together, that there's going to be some changes. So when you come next week for, or uh, two weeks from today, you'll notice we're actually going to be back facing this way. We're going to install our projection system so that we can actually follow along a little bit easier throughout the worship service. Uh, so be ready for that. You're going to see more children's elements, all of which I'm sharing with you because here's something I want you guys to all do. Someone in your neighborhood, in your circle of influence, at your place of work, or in your family is unchurched, right? They might be seekers of God trying to find a relationship with the Lord, and they may be very skeptical of of who God is and and sort of maybe even cynical about that reality. They may be uh, saints, people who are converted believers, the disciples even, but maybe they just moved into our community and they don't have a church home yet. What we want each and every one of you to do is to be in the business of actively looking and inviting people to come and be part of our worship. We want you to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might be surprised. I got canceled out of a flight this last week. Uh, Then my next flight got delayed by two or three hours, which means I missed my flight to San Luis Obispo and I had to spend an overnight in Dallas and everything else. All of that happened, I believe, at least in part, Because the next morning when I got on a flight, I spent three and a half hours sharing the gospel with somebody sitting next to me. So can God put you where he wants you to be if you are open to what he has for your life? And the answer to that is yes, he can. So be looking around you to see what it is that God might be doing so that you can be inviting and drawing people into the work that God is doing here at Redeemer and you can be sharing your faith, right? Okay, I think that's all our announcements for today, so let's continue in worship together. Every month, we have a chance to read a portion of the covenant that everyone signs upon entering membership here at RBC. Um, if you take a look at the insert that's in the, the program that you got when you came in, I'm going to be reading the part that says leader, and we will all read the part that says congregation together, and you can follow along with that insert. Having, as we trust, been brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do now, relying on his gracious aid, solemnly and joyfully enter into this covenant with one another as one body in Christ under his headship. Our united purpose is to glorify God by being a gospel-centered community. Our biblical priorities are to worship God, proclaim the gospel, disciple believers, serve everyone, and steward all of life to the glory of God. As a community of believers, saved and transformed by God's grace revealed in his gospel, we commit ourselves to love our fellow believers and to work and pray for the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We will forgive one another and will practice both biblical discipline and reconciliation. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavor with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We commit also to greet, serve, honor, encourage, submit to, and confess our sins to one another. In patience, love, and humility, We will instruct, exhort, and admonish one another. We will practice hospitality. We further commit ourselves to have and submit to biblically qualified spiritual leaders that will serve, teach, preach, equip, edify, pray for, oversee, and keep watch over and be a model to the church. Let's stand together.
study God's word, we're going to first go to God in prayer, and, and we're going to confess our sins, and we're going to admit our need for his grace. We're going to ask him to convict, forgive, and cleanse us of our sins, and then we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts and our minds as we hear the word proclaimed. So I invite you to pray along with me. Oh Lord, our most gracious Father, you are filled with mercy and steadfast love. Lord, we are embarrassed to come before you. For we have preferred the ways of this world to your ways. We have rebelled against your wisdom, and we have gotten into trouble. We have rejected your fatherly guidance and gotten lost altogether. Lord, we know that you and you alone, to you and you alone belongs righteousness. O oh Lord, and to us, confusion of face. Our most gracious Father, as you are filled with mercy and steadfast love, we ask that you would incline your ear to our troubles. Hear us as we pour out our sorrows before you. Forgive us, not on the ground of our own righteousness, but on the ground of your great mercy and on the grounds of the great mercy and the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we have confessed our sins to you, we take comfort in your great love that was displayed in how you gave your only Son so that Everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, Father, we know that you didn't send your son into the world to condemn the world, but in order to might, that the world might be saved through him. Jesus, we know that you are truly God and at the same time truly human and truly righteous. You are the mediator who was given to set us completely free and to make us right with God. By the power of your divinity, you bore the weight of God's anger in your humanity which restored us to righteousness and to life. Holy Spirit, now that we have had a chance to confess our sins and hear the assurance of our pardon through what Christ has done, we ask that you would allow our hearts and our minds to see Jesus as this word is proclaimed. I pray that your faithful servant, Pastor Chris, would speak boldly, clearly, lovingly, and effectively as he shares this good news. And I pray this proclamation would convict us and bring us to a place of repentance. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, through Christ, amen. And you may be seated. Thank you, Jason. What a wonderful prayer and what a great reminder to all of us 
that we do need a Savior. One of the common misconceptions that people can have about the Christian faith is that once they came into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, that sort of, that, that was the end of the story. That becoming a Christian was the climax of the film of your life and you sort of ride off into the spiritual sunset, never to have any trials, never to have any difficulties, and never to have anything significant really happen in the rest of your life. And, and nothing could be further from the biblical model of the way that Christians are called to live. In fact, in the New Testament, we find that over and over again, the apostles remind us that we are not yet home, that we are not citizens of this earth, that we are people who are on a journey, that we are sojourners in this world. Well, this series that we've entitled Sojourn is going to be a great study for us as we continue to dive into the life of Abram, later to be named Abraham, a man of faith who received great promises from God and yet who never saw on this side of eternity the fulfillment of everything that God had for him. He lived in what the biblical scholar Ian Duguid calls the reality gap of faith. Here's what God has said He is doing and will do, and yet that's not what Abram experienced in all of his life. So, we're going to spend the next several months looking at the life of Abram and looking at, at how God takes him from being Abram into Abraham, how He gives him these great promises and He sees partial fulfillment of those promises, and we can see how, as Scripture reminds us, we are called to look back into the lives of these great saints and recognize that we have much to learn from them about how God is calling us to live out the reality of our faith. So I want to invite you to read along with me from Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 9 today, Genesis 12, 1 through 9. And you can follow along with the YouVersion Bible app, of course, and get all of the today's message notes or follow along on the paper notes as well. Uh, as we read together from Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negeb. This is God's holy, inerrant, and eternal word May he add his blessing to its reading and its proclamation. Last week, if you joined us for the opening sermon on this series, where I got to preach from you for, uh, to you from Alabama, one of the blessings of technology, uh, we learned a couple of things about an inheritance that we all have, and, and tied throughout the story 
of Abram is this idea of inheritance. So you might remember that last week we remember that we saw that all of us have inherited a past. None of us comes into the moment where we encounter God without having had a past reality, a past story. And a lot of us, those, those past stories can be very broken or they may, may be very good, but we recognize that even if our stories have been individually good, we recognize that the human race has a major problem and that we've inherited a problem of sin and brokenness in this world. And then we saw that we not only have inherited a, a past and, and all of us as humans a, a problem, we've inherited a promise from God. And that promise is that we will come to Him and enter into a relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we can become a people of faith redeemed by God's grace. And that means that if you are a person of faith, that your real life has just begun, that you, the moment you come to saving faith, you enter into a fourth inheritance, and that is a pilgrimage, a journey. And so today we're going to see, as we continue our study in the life of Abram, we're going to see that we've not only got this great pilgrimage, but that there are four common elements to the pilgrimage of faith. Four things we share in common with Abram, at least four things, and they are that God wants us to hear Him, He wants us to obey Him, He wants us to trust Him, and He wants us to worship Him. And if you're ever looking at your life and you feel like, man, I'm just not sure that my life is really about what God wants it to be about, or you feel like you've gotten off track on your faith journey and you feel like, how do I, how do I get back into right faith journey with God? These are great four elements for you to test your life against, to say, wait a second, am I really hearing God? Am I obeying God? Am I trusting God? Am I worshiping Him? So let's take a look and see how that played out in the life of Abram and how it might apply to us as believers. Uh, the, one of the most amazing things about Abram is that he is one of the few people in the Bible that is called the friend of God. Did you know that? That's one of his titles, actually. And as we go through the life of Abram, we're going to see how he comes into this place of an intimate relationship with God. Now, if you want to build an intimate relationship with somebody, one of the closest things, one of the things that's, that's, you know, just simply required is you have to be in intimacy and proximity to them. You have to hear them, right? You have to hear them. And so that's what we see. Look at the very first uh, uh, line of today's passage, Genesis 12, 1, and you see this line, Now the Lord said to Abram, God was speaking. We don't, we don't know how God spoke to Abram in particular. We don't know if this was an audible voice. And sometimes the Bible's very clear. It says God appears in a vision uh, to, to Jacob, one of Abram's descendants, or uh, he passes uh, by Moses in a great force, or he uh, appears in a burning bush. We don't know how God showed up to talk to Abram, but Abram knew that God the Lord Himself had spoken to him. And one of the things that you and I get to have in common with Abram is that we know a God who speaks, God who is not silent. You know, if you look at the idols of the world, those gods never speak to you. They never talk to you. But the God of the Bible, the true God, the God of all creation, He is a God who speaks. The psalmist says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters, and He's Thinking back to that moment in the Genesis creation when, when the earth is formless and void and there is nothing that exists and, and matter is being created and then God speaks and He says, and the Lord said, let there be light and there was light and the Lord said, let there be a boundary between the upper waters and the lower waters and atmosphere begins to be created and let the boundaries of the water be and, and God speaks and God speaks forth life onto earth and, and sun and moon and stars and the vast universe and all of the flying creatures and the fish in the sea and the great sea mammals and all of that stuff happens. And then, man, and all the animals of the earth, God speaks the voice of the Lord 
is over all that is formless and void and chaotic. God speaks into a chaotic and broken world, and His glory thunders. Do you know the God who speaks like that? And by the way, that's not something that God did just for Abram. He speaks still. And for believers, we have His Word. We have His Word that's been written down. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, right? But it has been breathed out. It is God's spoken Word. It's not just somebody's opinion. It's not the Apostle Paul's opinion. It's not Peter's ideas. It's not Moses' ramblings. No, the Bible is the voice of God speaking to the saints so that each believer can be thoroughly equipped for the Christian life, the journey that we are on. You know, sometimes I, I'm, if you're like me, you may think, man, I, I really would like it if God would just, you know, come down and talk to me right now, you know, have a conversation with me. And he says, good news, I have talked to you, here it is. And so often what I find is that whenever I'm not feeling connected to God, when I'm lost on my faith journey, the truth is I've just not been listening. He's talking. I'm not listening. I'm not going to Him in the Word and letting His Holy Spirit speak through His Word into my life. Are you hearing God speak? When God speaks, He does a couple of different things. We could go on and on. I'll highlight two. God's revealing Himself. Sometimes we approach Scripture or the voice of God because we're looking for wisdom on how to live, and that's a good thing. Or we, we go to God, kind of maybe we want Him to justify us and say that what we're doing is okay and we're, somebody else is telling us what we're, not, what we're doing is wrong or, or we feel guilty or ashamed, and those are, those are all important things. Listen, we should go to God with all of life. But can I just say to you that so often we fail to go to God for Him to show us who He is, who He is. For 29 years, I've had the pleasure of being married to this wonderful woman right here. This last week was our 29th anniversary. Last Sunday when I wasn't with you was our anniversary, and when I wasn't with her. But for 29 years, we've been together. How do I know after 29 years what's in her mind? The answer is, I don't, unless I listen and she speaks. How do I know my wife? I can observe her. I can, after much gained experience through those observations and through many intimate conversations, I can begin to understand what's in her mind. How do you know God? You can observe Him at work, and then you can listen to Him. And He can tell you not just what to do or how to respond to a situation or what He thinks about a particular station, but, but you can know Him. He's in the business of revealing Himself. And I think this is so important as we study the life of Abram. God is very much if not more interested in than telling Abram what to do, you're going to see that God is in the business of saying, Abram, this is who I am. I want you to know me. The conversation isn't primarily about you, it's about me. And when we go to the Bible, we should want to see the God of glory the God of weight and majesty and significance. And, and so commenting on, on Genesis chapter 12, we have Stephen preaching a sermon in Acts chapter 7 verse 2, and he says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. God shows up and says, Abram, this is who I am. I want you to know me. Now, when God reveals Himself, He's going to reveal who He is and what He is like, and then He's going to say, therefore, if you're going to be in relationship with me, this is who you need to be and what you must be like. In other words, He's going to give us commands. 
He's going to say, this is who you need to be and what your character needs to be like, what your attitudes need to be. And that's what we see. Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abram, and listen to this sentence because we're going to break it down in at least three key elements. He says to him, Abram, go. Go from, and that language can be go, leave, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I'm not going to show you right now. I'm going to show it to you in the future, right? So think of it this way. What God is saying to Abram, he often says to us, I want you to go, I want you to leave, and I want you to follow me. Go, leave, and follow me. Isn't that the experience of the Christian faith? There are places that Jesus wants us to go. We're to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We are to be His presence in all these places. We are to go ye therefore into all the world, making disciples of all the nations, right? We are to go places that God is telling us to go. And that means we're going to have to leave things behind. What did Abram have to leave behind? God listed them off for him. He said, Abram, you're going to have to leave your country. Your nation can no longer be your primary identifier. Leave your nation, leave your clan, your kindred, your extended family, the, the entire system of support that you have, and your specific father's house. You have to leave behind even those close, intimate relatives of yours. yours. God never, ever, ever, do we find in Scripture, allows us to always take our past with us. So many people want to follow Jesus Christ. They want to go where He says, but they want to bring along all of their past with them. Folks, I challenge you, read the Bible from cover to cover. Find the person that God allows them to keep everything they had before they encountered Him. That's not His nature. Jesus Christ makes that abundantly clear. He says in Luke 9, 23, if you're going to come after me, you're going to follow me, you're going to go where I send you, guess what? You have to deny yourself and daily take up your cross. You must die to yourself. A little bit farther in Luke, in Luke 14, 33, he says, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So, here's the question. Can you go where Jesus wants you to go and follow Him, which we're going to see in just a second, unless you've given up who you are? So many people want to follow Jesus, but they don't want to give up their identity. They don't want to give up their security. They don't want to give up the things that they've known in their past. They want to keep their, not only their sin habits, but the good blessings that God has given them so far. Nothing that Abram is told to give up are bad, sinful things. It's not bad to have a nation. It's not bad to have a clan. It's not bad to have a father's household. And God says, I want you to give those things up. Jesus repeatedly makes these kinds of demands. Peter, John, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That means you have to leave your nets behind. You have to leave your ways of fishing behind. Matthew, leave your tax collection booth. Come, follow me over and over and over again. Saul, you once were a Pharisee. I'm going to make you the great missionary. Over and over and over again, the God of all Scripture, the only God who is real, is going to come to you and He's going to say, I'm going to send you and it's going to cost you. If your faith has not cost you something infinitely precious to you, I want to suggest to you that you may not yet have fully encountered the only God there ever has been and ever will be. Period. Go, leave, follow. Abram's not told where he's going to go. He says, I, I just want you to follow me. I'm going to show you. You're going to wake up in the morning and say, where do I go? And he says, I'm going to tell you where to go. Well, that's also what Jesus says to each and every one of us, isn't it? When he said to Peter and John, he said, leave your nets behind. He said, come, follow me. When he's restoring Peter after Peter betrays him the night of his, before his crucifixion, you know what he says? He says, listen, Peter, here's the deal. I want you to shepherd my sheep. I want you to do this. But you, Peter, follow me. 
Jesus is saying that to every believer. Your life is a journey. I'm going to send you where I want to send you. You're going to be required to leave behind things that you don't want to leave behind. And then you're going to simply follow me. Too often we want to know all of the advanced plans. Now, planning in and itself is not a bad thing. It can be an act of wisdom. It can, it, it can be a, an opposition to foolishness. But when we hold our plans tightly and we say, God, you need to follow my plan, He's no long, we're no longer following Him. We're trying to make Him follow us. If we hear this God who's giving us these commands and we are walking towards Him, we must go, leave, and follow. Okay, the second quality that we see in the life of Abram is not just that he heard God, but that he actually obeyed God. Look in verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Have you ever thought about the fact that we as Christians know far more what we ought to do, what we should do, than we actually do? So, we have parents, many of you in this room are parents, all of us have been children. What do you call a child who knows what they ought to do and who doesn't do it? Disobedient. Too many people approach the Christian faith with the idea that obedience to Jesus Christ is optional. It's good for you to know what is in God's Word. It's good for you to know what He's saying. It is much, much better for you to not simply know, but to obey, right? To do what He has told you to do, as Abram did. Obedience, brothers and sisters, is not just knowledge or theory, ideas about Christianity, but action. When Jesus commissioned us to go and make disciples, He said, teach them to obey everything that I commanded you. So, you can have great religious leaders who have no problem going on Twitter and lying about fellow pastors. They know they're not supposed to bear false witness. They know they're not supposed to gossip. They know they're not supposed to slander, and yet they do it blatantly in front of a watching world. Scripture says, don't sue anyone in your church. Yet we have one of the most prominent churches in the United States, pastored by a godly man whose members are suing him because they aren't happy with the direction of the church. What do you call that? Disobedience. That's what you call it. Disobedience not to their pastor, but to God. Over and over again, it's easier for us to know what we ought to do. God says not just the things that we shouldn't be doing, like not murdering and not lusting and not filling our lives with pornography and not filling our lives with idolatries of various kinds and not pursuing money. Yes, there's all the things we're not supposed to do, but there's all the things we are to do. Every Christian I know that's been a believer for any length of time knows they're supposed to tell people about Jesus, right? So when was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? You know what we call that? Say the word, disobedience. Disobedience, right? Folks, over and over again, we need to understand that obedience is not just knowledge of God's Word or theory, but action. And it's an action that flows not simply because we have to or because we are fearful. No, in Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation in His grace. Praise God is greater than our sin. And when our sin abounds, His grace is greater. But obedience is an act of love. It's because you have a delight in God that you want to be fully pleasing to Him. And we want to obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Don't just say you love me. Let your life be a testimony of it. God, brothers and sisters, wants obedience more than He wants religious uh, piety or religious expression. And that's an Old Testament principle and reality fleshed out over and over again. We find in 1 Samuel 15, 22, 
Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. In fact, the Old Testament prophets would say, Don't, God, God says, stop bringing sacrifices because you're not obeying me. You're not caring for, caring for the immigrant. You're not protecting the weak and vulnerable. You're not doing all of the things. You're not stopping oppression of people in your land, and yet you want to keep showing up at the temple with all your sacrifices. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And once again, we find that obedience is costly. I don't know why we've bought into a mythology that obeying Jesus isn't supposed to be difficult. We should expect difficulty. We are following after the one who was crucified, the one who sacrificed a comfortable place in heaven to be born to poor people. To not get all the rights, to be mocked, spat upon, humiliated, to be uh, threatened to be executed at the beginning of his ministry by his own hometown. A person who had no place to lay his head. Yet we say, I want to obey you, Jesus, so I'll do it as soon as you make my life comfortable and easy. Difficulty is to be expected. Discomfort is to be expected in our obedience. Just look at the life of Abram and you'll see it in so many different places. Hey, how old was he when this journey started? We have many senior adults here. How old is Abram in this story? Did you guys catch that? 75. And we're going to find that in just the next few chapters, we're going to cover 24 years. For 24 years, before the next set of major events occur, in the life of Abram. He's going to have all this journey, and we're going to look at all these things, but 24 years are going to pass before he begins to see the true fulfillment of God's promise. Never say, you're too old to follow Jesus. The Bible has given you plentiful examples, right? And guess what? You're going to be surrounded by people who may not want you to be wholeheartedly obedient. Others may choose to settle. They say, isn't half-hearted obedience enough? You see this also, right, in parenting with children? You know, you tell the kid, don't go over there. You say, there's a boundary. And what does the child do? They walk halfway there. But the spirit of disobedience is still there, right? Right? Or you tell your child to do something, clean up your room, so they put away a few toys. But the rest of the room's a giant mess, right? They settle for halfway obedience. Apparently, this is what's happening with Abram's family as well. They start on their journey from Ur, way down there along the, the, the end of the Persian Gulf, and they go all the way from what had been kind of the New York City of the time to what, what Ian Duguid calls the Los Angeles. They went from, from New York to L.A. It's sort of like, God, I know you're telling me to go on a journey uh, so we're going to go from Ur to Haran, and Haran's kind of the L.A. of the times, and, and may, maybe, God, this is far enough. And that's where Terah settles. He settles there. But Abram's call isn't to settle in Haran. It's to keep on going, isn't it? And that's what you'll find, is that there are people who will settle all around you for half-hearted obedience, and you'll be tempted to say, well, if that's as far as they've gone, then that's all I should do. It's just like the little kids again, right? If you have siblings, right, you tell the siblings, okay, each of you have got half of a room. I want you to clean up your half of the room so the one kid puts away three toys, and then they, they leave, and then the other kid goes, well, I'm, I'm going to put away four toys, good enough, and I'm out, <laughs> They still both haven't obeyed, right? So we need to recognize this reality that on the faith journey that we are on, that others may settle. And that means that sometimes we are called to the business of gathering other people into obedience to God's command. Now, notice what Abram does in verse 5. Abram, when he gets on the bus to actually go obey God and move from Haran to wherever it is that God's going to take him, 
Abram takes Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all of their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran. This is probably both indentured servants uh, and, and maybe even slaves and then also uh, business people who worked for him. He gathers them all up and he's like, listen, I'm all going to go on a journey with God here. I don't know where we're going. I just know the direction is south. <laughs> go to the land that God's going to show us. Brothers and sisters, we are not meant to live the faith journey on our own. And in our obedience, we are called to call others into obedience. Come, let us worship God together. Come, let us proclaim the good news. Come, let us disciple our community. Come, let us serve the people who are hurting and weak around us, come, let us steward all of life to the glory of God. That's what church is. Us gathering the saints, gathering the skeptics, gathering the seekers, the people who are on a journey to God, and inviting them into a corporate obedience together. So, going back to my illustration, it's like one sibling being a true and better sibling and saying to the one who's only doing a half-hearted job, come, let's do this right. Let us obey God together. And isn't it more encouraging when you've got people obeying Jesus around you and following after God around you? And we're called to do that just like Abram does. And by the way, just as a reminder here, God's not just going to make things difficult. Sometimes He's going to call us to what seems impossible. Do you remember what we learned about Abram's wife last week? Sarai was barren. She's 66 and never had a child. And God's taking them into a foreign land. And God's going to say to them, I'm going to do amazing things, which we'll take a look in just a second. But He's going to put you in impossible situations. So God takes Abram down all the way from Haran, 587 or so miles, journeying by land, to Shechem. And you know what Abram sees? God, this is the land that you're taking me to. It's full of Canaanites. This land isn't empty. It's occupied. And guess what? The Canaanites were not known for being nice. They're hardcore, violent pagans. The many different groups of the Canaanites are, in fact, known for their barbarism. So, Abram's on a journey, and God says, hey, guess what? I'm going to give you all this land. And Abram's like, look around you, God. There's a bunch of people already here, and they're not nice. Right? Does God ever take you into places that seem impossible? I think He does. I think he takes believers all the time into situations that seem impossible so that he can say, oh yeah, watch this. I'm going to do something. You follow, you obey, you do what I'm telling you to, and I'm going to act. Because God doesn't say, Abram, you're going to give yourself this land. He says, I'm going to give it to you. So we need to hear, we need to obey, and we need to trust one of the most remarkable things we're going to see about Abram and about Abraham as he becomes known and his family and everything else is their faith and how God develops and matures their faith and how they come to trust God, not simply to believe in Him theoretically with knowledge, but to actually trust Him. The author of Hebrews in verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 and 9 says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. If you and I want to obey God, we're going to have to believe that God is everything He said He is and that He will do all that He has promised. Otherwise, we will not obey. We won't. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. How are you and I going to obey God when it seems impossible, when it seems confusing, when we don't know where God is leading us? You're going to do it if you trust Him. 
So let's take a look at what some of the things are that God promises. Look at what He promises Abraham. And I believe these same promises are made to all people who are on a genuine faith journey with God through Jesus Christ. He promises him satisfaction. You may miss this. But look in verses, uh, chapter 12, verse 2, and you're going to see he says to Abram, I will make of you, Abram, a great nation. Remember, Sarah has not had a kid. She's 66. And in this culture, the most valuable thing you had, greater than all your wealth, was to have an offspring. It's the great longing of Abram's heart. And God says, I'm going to give you a child, and I'm going to make you into a great and mighty nation. He says, I will bless you. I'm going to pour forth all my goodness on you. God makes that promise to believers. He says, guess what? I'm going to take your life, which you may feel like is very insignificant and small, and I'm going to give you offspring. I'm going to multiply out the reality of your life. I'm going to satisfy your soul with my blessings. And that is true even when it seems impossible. Even when you think, God, we've tried and we've tried for 66 years. Well, how long had Abram and Sarah been married? Probably since she was about 16 years old. So for 50 years, they've tried to have children, no children. 50 years. Wow. Brothers and sisters, do you believe in a God who's doing things that are greater than you and I can ask or imagine? Listen to what God said to Abram. He says, Abram, Genesis 22, we'll come and study this in a, in a few weeks' time. He says, Abram, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed. Notice when the blessing comes. Not, God bless me, then I'll choose to obey you. Obey, and I'll bless you. Stop trying to make the outcome secure first. God is alone the God who can satisfy the human soul. He doesn't just promise Abraham satisfaction. He promises him significance. He says in verse 2, I will make your name great. The people at the Tower of Babel tried to make their own name great, and many people today are in the business of trying to make their own name great through social media, through achievements at work, through uh, perfect parenting in a million different ways. Uh, look at me. I'm significant. I matter. And God says, all of your efforts are a waste. They're just like Babel. You can name nations after yourself, God says, and I will make your name be erased from history. But to Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. Do you know that you can cross the globe you can step into more than 140, 150 nations easily around the world where you will find people who know the name of Abraham. Because the Muslim world knows Abraham, the Christian world knows Abraham, the, Jew, uh, the, the Jewish people know Abraham. All around the world, people know Abraham. His name is great. Because God makes us significant. God promises Abraham security. Look at uh, verse 3. He says, Abraham or Abram, I will bless those who bless you. And if anybody dishonors you, or uh, Robert Alter notes the, the word here is damn. He says, anybody who damns you, who attempts to come against you, I will damn them. I will curse them. If God's the one who's defending you, if God's the one who's protecting you, can you be more secure than that? So often we're trying to make ourselves secure instead of trusting in God to make us secure. God promises Abraham soil, a home, a homeland. He says, right now, you're going to wander. In fact, a little bit later, we're going to see he tells Abram, you actually, Abram, will never actually get the land I promised you. Not an inch, the New Testament comments. 
but I'm going to give your people a home. In fact, verse 7, he says, to your offspring, I will give this land, a homeland. And you know, every Christian has been promised a home that isn't here. That God's going to create a new heavens and a new earth, and we're going to be invited to be with Him forever. God's promised us an eternal home. And then God promises Abram purpose. Purpose for his life. He says, listen, I'm not blessing you so that you can sit there and count your money and enjoy your own security and create your own twisted satisfactions. No, he says, I'm blessing you. Look in verse 2. Look in verse 3. You'll see the same thing. I'm blessing you so that you will be a blessing. I'm blessing you so that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The language is so precise here. In you, Abram, in you shall all the offspring of the earth be blessed. God has a plan that is far more significant than anything Abram has on his mind. God says, I'm going to make your life count in ways that are bigger than you can imagine. I have a purpose for you, brothers and sisters, several things I want you to understand. If you and I are in Christ Jesus, we are in Abram. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are in Abram. And that means we have this burden of being a blessing. So many Christians running around in the prosperity gospel movement are saying, God, bless me, God, bless me, God, bless me. Trying to bargain with God. God, if you bless me over here, I'll give you this. God says, don't you understand? It doesn't work that way. I bless you so that you can be a blessing. If I pour out goodness on your life, I expect you to pour that goodness out on the earth. We've been blessed to be a blessing. So we see not simply there that God makes these promises, but He acts. God's in the business of drawing people to Himself. Never forget, as we're going through the life of Abram, that this was not some God-fearing man. No, look in Joshua 24, and you see God's description of him. The Lord, the God of Israel, said, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates River, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor. And they served other gods. Then God says, I took your father Abraham from beyond the river. I led him through all the land of Canaan. And I made his offspring many. God interrupts people's lives. And I don't know why we forget that so often as Christians, especially when it comes to sharing our faith. We forget that all of us had a life before Jesus. We were all worshiping other gods. We were all slaves to various passions and pleasures. And then Jesus showed up. And we know He did it for us, but we forget that and we think He can't do it for somebody else. But God's in the business of doing that, of appearing to people. And He comes to proclaim and enact the saving good news of Jesus. I'm going to blow your minds here. If you've got a Bible, go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. If you've got the electronic, just keep following down. Look at Galatians 3, 8. The Scripture, it says foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, the Scripture, God's Word, speaking into time and space, looks forward into time and says there's coming a time when all the nations, the Gentiles, not people who are biological lineage of Abraham, He's going to justify them if they come and place their faith in Him. He's going to count their, not count their sins against them, but count Christ's righteousness for Him. He says, Scripture foreseeing that, by faith, look at this, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Does that just blow you away? Abraham, God shows up and says, ha, Abraham, I got some good news for you. In your offspring is going to come one who will bless the whole earth. The gospel to Abraham. Abraham, through you, one is coming who will fix everything that has been broken since Adam and Eve. 
Abraham, in ways bigger than you can understand, will come one who is going to fix it all. And that's what we find in Jesus. Jesus will become the Savior of the world. Remember, it's Jesus that, that we find that is the son of Abraham. It's Jesus who will bear our sins, free us from sin's bondage, heal our brokenness, and reconcile us to God. So that Peter, reflecting on these kinds of truths, can say he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live live to righteousness. And by his wounds, we can be healed. And we were straying like sheep, but we've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. What is, what's, what's been broken since Adam is going to get fixed. Their sins are not going to be counted against you. And you're no longer going to be under sin's dominion. And all the brokenness that the world has felt since the beginning of time, Abram, through your offspring, I'm going to heal the wounds of the earth. And Abram, I'm going to bring everybody back to God. I'm going to reconcile my children back to me. That's an amazing promise. How do you appropriate that promise? You believe. You trust that God's going to do everything that He says. If you look in Galatians 3.7 and 3.9, those two verses that border Galatians 3.8, it says this, Know then it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Verse 9, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham. We enter into the blessings of Abraham when we place our faith in Abraham's offspring, Jesus Christ. You say, how can I know this is true? Because God is infinitely trustworthy. If He's given you His Son, Jesus Christ, how will He not also along with Him freely give you all things? So, quick question, do you completely trust God? Do you trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding? Do you acknowledge Him in all your ways? Not in theory. In the ordinary, daily realities of life. I'm in this moment, in this situation, in this place, with these people because God has put me here. Can I trust Him? Oh, yes, you can. Because He's good. Do you believe that God is trustworthy, trustworthy to guide you? The psalmist says, if I take on the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Abram, go out from this land. Go, church, do difficult things into places that are difficult and challenging and you're not sure about. And he says, even there I will lead you. My right hand shall hold you. You say, but what about my provision? Do you believe God's going to provide all that is needed? In the next few months, our church is going to undergo massive transitions. We have, we have beloved people who are leaving to move. We're going to be attempting once again to publicly gather in people. I want to ask you something. Do you believe in the God who provides? I do. He provided you. Paul says, My God will supply every need of yours according to His glory in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you believe in a God who has done enough and can do enough to save you and me from our sin, to free us from its power? No matter how pernicious and long-running, do you believe in a God who can can save us from our brokenness. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing you and I can do to earn it. By grace, we have been saved through faith. And this is not of our own doing, but the gift of God. Hear, obey, trust. You know what you call a person who lives like that? A worshiper. A person whose life is no longer about themselves. Look in Genesis 12, 7. What's Abram's response to this journey as God's leading him? He builds an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on as, as uh, Robert Alter points out, the phrase actually there is he pulls up stakes. 
He pulls up stakes to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitches his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And what does he do once he gets to Bethel? There again, he builds an altar to the Lord and he calls upon the name of the Lord. God, what's next? That's a life of worship. If you're a person who wants to hear God and you're actively being obedient and you're trusting Him, your life will be changed so that your life is no longer about yourself. All of life will not be about you, but about God. Your question in the morning will not be, what do I want to do today? Or what must I do today? Or what must I do to get what I need? All of your questions will be about God. What does God want me to do today? What resources will He provide me to do this with and how do I go about it in a way that is pleasing to Him? The biblical term for that is godliness. Godliness is not, we, we get it confused with being ethically or morally upright. Certainly a godly person is ethically and morally upright, but godliness is having a life that's not about yourself but about God. Self is no longer in the center of your thinking. Paul admonishes Timothy, he says, Timothy, don't have anything to do with irreverent, silly myths. Timothy, train yourself for godliness. Grow yourself in godliness. Bodily training is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for this present life and also for the life to come. In other words, if you're going to spend all of eternity being about Jesus, start practicing right now. Start making your every day be about Him. Worship is about relating all of life to God. It's about delighting in God in all of life. It's not primarily just about worshiping and songs and prayers. And those are outward expressions of inward delight. You know, it, it, I, we haven't yet done this. I'm not yet sure how I'm going to figure out how to do it. One of these days, I'm going to teach you guys a sermon series on the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, which is a sex novel in the middle of your Bible. That's what it is. Husband and wife delighting in each other in profound intimacy. Why is that in your Bible? At least one of the reasons is this. God wants you to understand that the rapturous intimacy and joy and delight that is pictured forth in an intimate marriage is how God feels about you and how He wants you to feel about Him. So here's the question. Is God your actual delight? I know lots of people that tr say they're following Jesus, but they don't like Him. They don't enjoy Him. Brothers and sisters, a life of worship is about finding God to be your soul's delight. The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. If God's your greatest joy, God's going to give you more of Him. More of Him. And that means you and I in worship must present all of our lives to God. You know, in worship in the Old Testament, as we're going to see, they bring offerings to the Lord. Well, if you believe in the God who's offered up His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sin, the only righteous response, as the hymnist said, was to say, my, my soul, my life, my all I give to you. Right? Isn't that what the Bible calls us to? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says it explicitly, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present 
your bodies, and that's not just your physical bodies, it's, it's fully encompassing, it's your life. Present your life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Come to God and say each day, God, these hands, they're yours. These feet, there's, they're yours. These eyes, they're yours. These ears, they're y- yours. My mouth, it's yours. My bank account, it's yours. My wife, my children, my husband, they're yours. My job, it's yours. It's all yours. It's not mine. Do with it as you will. That's worship. Consume it. Refine it. Give it back to me. It's all yours. And if you and I do that, we will find that the overflow of our hearts The overflow of the delight, the overflow of the offering, the overflow of relating all of life to God is that we will glorify God. We will give Him the praise and thanksgiving that He is due. And we'll do it in the smallest things in life, whether we eat or we drink, we'll do all to the glory of God. And brothers and sisters, we don't do this just on Sunday mornings. We do it on Sunday afternoons and Sunday evenings and Monday mornings, and we do it not just once a week, or we do it every week, over and over again, every day of every week. We do it in endurance. Like Abram, we do it for 24 years and beyond. We endure. Abram comes to Bethel, offers up to God, calls upon the name of the Lord, and guess what? He journeys on until Jesus calls us home the journey of hearing obeying trusting and worshiping God continues we endure until he says finally I'm bringing you home to me to me it is so sad to see people who have either outright rejected the faith or who once professed the faith, step into eternity with no awareness of where they're going. But the life of the believer who spent their life following in the path of Abram, in the path of Abram's offspring, Jesus, those people, they step into the moment when they say, I'm finally home. And then, as C.S. Lewis said, the real journey begins. And we find that everything that we've experienced was just the cover page, and all eternity is laid out before us to see and know and delight in the living God. Let's pray that God gives us that kind of faith. Father, would you take now these broken and imperfect words, apply them to our hearts and our minds in ways that are new and fresh. Where there is sin, cleanse us. Where there is wavering faith, strengthen us. Where there is brokenness and woundedness, bring healing and the salve of your grace and mercy. Where there is apathy, stir us up. Grant us to follow you, to hear your voice, to trust you in all of life, to anew and afresh present our lives as worship unto you. We ask this so so confidently, not because of the perfection of our words, but because of your working of grace. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our perfect Savior. Amen. Today I have the privilege to lead us all in communion, but before we take the elements, I want to look at what Christ means when he says, do this in remembrance of me. So I have two points that I want to review that we can reflect on. Uh, Firstly, there are two elements, and secondly, uh, that there are two heart orientations. So firstly, there's two elements. There is the unleavened bread, 
uh, and then there's the grape juice or the wine. The unleavened bread represents Christ's sinless body, which was broken for our sins. Having leavened or sinful bodies ourselves, we're a- unable to fulfill our covenant with God, and so we're all in need of Christ's sacrifice. And the grape juice or wine represents the new covenant, which is in Christ's blood. Secondly, there's two orientations to remember. The first orientation is vertically to Christ. At the Lord's table, Christ invites believers to feast spiritually by faith on every spiritual blessing bought by the body and blood of Christ. Unbelievers are not invited to this feast, and so we ask that if you aren't sure whether you believe in Christ or you're not sure what that means, uh, please simply observe today and feel free to come to talk to Chris or Jason or I uh, after the service. And we aren't just invited to the feast today, but we look forward in anticipation to Christ's return for the feast that is to come and communion with him. The second orientation is horizontally, out towards the the body of faith. The word communion comes from the Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship, community, or even sharing or, or joint participation. So there's a togetherness that's associated with this word. So we remember here that Christ's body has been broken, the same for me as it's been broken for you, and his blood has been shed, the same as for me as it has been for you. And in this remembrance, we find that we're all saved by the same grace and are invited corporately into Christ's feast. So similarly, if you're in regular fellowship with the body of Christ, but you have division in your heart with one or more of the members of the body, we ask that you either abstain from communion or to make a covenant with God for a specific time that you intend to seek reconciliation with the other member or members of the body. So I'm going to invite the the band to play a song for us, Um, and as they play, I invite each of you to remember and to reflect on and consider these two points prayerfully with God. So let's enter into a time of worship and prayer.
can peel back that top layer of film to uh, release that delicious wafer on top there. <coughs> For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then go ahead and peel back the foil, sealing in the grape juice there. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand together and sing one more time. to a close today. I'm going to close this out with a benediction. Um, so let's meditate on these words about God as we go throughout our week. Uh, I'm going to sing this benediction. It's from the book of Jude. If you know it, you can sing along. If not, just meditate on these words about God this morning. Now to him who is able to keep you who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be your glory, majesty, dominion, and power for all time, both now and forever. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen and amen. All right. Go with God this week. Now, just a reminder, take a few minutes, if you will, to fellowship with each other before you start tearing down. <laughs>